have Professor Charles Falco, who will discuss how optical equipment developed 1,000 years ago by Ibn al Haytam and revolutionized painting during the Renaissance. Please, Professor. Second, until we get the PowerPoint on the screen. There we go. Almost. We need sound. So what I'm going to do is, um, and please do bring the sound up for the rest. So I'm going to talk about the science of optics, the history of Western art, and the influence of Ibn al-Haytham. And for this, I'd like to thank, of course, the UN, UNESCO, John Dudley, all the usual suspects, but in particular, the Saudi ambassador who um, insisted on having Ibn al-Haytham as part of these celebrations. I'm gonna tell you about David Hockney in a second. So hopefully the sound is up now. So my collaborator on the work I'm going to introduce Ibn al-Haytham with is David Hockney, about which two respected dictionaries of art and artists talk about his renown. We need sound, guys. Let's try that again. Can, you, can we bring the sound up? Well, this, is gonna, this talk's going to be really bad without sound. <laughs> so. Um, I, they made me submit my presentation a week ago because they said um, we'd sort out all the issues. And uh, so we try again. Here we go. David Hockney, our most celebrated Hockney living Hockney. artist. He is considered to be one of Britain's greatest contemporary artists. His originality and skill have ensured his success from the beginning of his career. So we have five Nobel Prize winners in physics in the audience. If there were a Nobel Prize in art, David Hockney certainly would be considered for that prize. So he's a world-class artist. And for our purposes, what's important? I admit, for instance, I'm, I am interested in pictures. I keep saying this. I'm interested in uh, how you make pictures. Now, what passes for interdisciplinary research, usually, if I, a solid-state physicist, collaborate with an electrical engineer, we call that interdisciplinary research. The work I'm going to talk about is a result of truly interdisciplinary work, which I encourage lots of you to, to take part in. It's between a scientist and an artist. And as a result, we made discoveries in art history. And I'm going to talk fast. I, at no small expense to myself, purchased the domain name art-optics.com because you can all remember that art-optics.com. And if you go there, it bounces you to my university website, which is incredibly long uh, URL. You won't remember it. And since there's always dyslexic people in the audience, I also purchased optics-art.com. <laughs> so you have no excuse not to remember this. You can go there, and you can learn much more about what we've done. And ironically, I work in molecular beam epitaxy, but the European Science Foundation named a thesis after me, the Hockney Falco thesis. And what's important for this is that the paintings that we analyzed are all from Western Europe that I'm going to talk about, and they're all in the major museums, the, um, the Uffizi in Florence, the Prado, the, uh, the Hermitage. And if you believe the directors of those museums, well, why not? We'll believe them. There are 25 million people a year visit, and we made discoveries that nobody noticed before. And just as several examples, two paintings that are major, by major icons of Western art, Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini Marriage, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this Hans Holbein. There's not time to show you very much in this talk, so let me magnify the Hans Holbein. And we have a painting that actually is a very large painting. It's in London, and this is shown, I would say, uh, maybe twice life size. It's a very large painting. But when we look at this, um, if we magnify, say, that globe, and I rotate it upside down, it becomes right side up, and we look at the word Sicily, it's in five-point font. Your computer doesn't give you five-point font because you can't read it. It's too small. Every square inch of that painting is done with that level of detail. 
if I put that, I mean, that um, detail back in, we look again and what is this? That blur. Well, if you could all come up on stage and look at the painting at a grazing angle, you'd see it's a skull. But it's a bad skull. Now, if you read art history books, everybody's very thrilled that it's a skull, but we're scientists. We are skeptical. I, by the time I saw this, I looked at it and I thought, that's a really bad skull. I wonder if optics could tell us how that skull was made. So if we take that skull, if I linearly compress it, I get this. Let me enlarge that. There's Holbein's skull, linearly compressed. And there's a real skull. It's wrong. The jaw is too long. The skull's got this bulge back here. It's got this right eye that's just sinister looking. I don't know if you go trick-or-treating on Halloween in France. In the US, if you're a parent, if you come across a skull like this on a doorstep, you don't let your kid go trick-or-treating at that store, because there's something wrong with the person with that skull. Can optics tell us how that was made? Well, it's certainly an anamorphic skull could be made by a transformation. One could take and draw on graph paper a picture, take nonlinear graph paper, and do to one-to-one -one correspondence, paint the, um, or draw the skull, and you've got an anamorphic skull. But if you linearly compress this back again, you get back the skull you started with, minus the defects you introduced. So let's see if that's what happens. So I'll take a skull, I will reflect it and focus it by a concave mirror, which actually many optical scientists don't realize you can produce a good image with a concave mirror. That's a whole nother lecture. And I will focus it at grazing angle on my, my uh, easel, and then I'll take a picture of it, and presumably I will get back the Hans Holbein anamorphic skull. But when I do that, if I take away the concave mirror, this is exactly what the mirror sees, so we think that this is what we're going to get back. I don't get that back. I get this blur. The jaw is in focus, so let me just paint the jaw in. At that point, the rest of my canvas, the rest of Hans Holbein canvas, is blank. So refocus. Move the concave mirror, move the lens to refocus. No, actually, the jaw is out of focus, but it doesn't matter, because you've already painted that. We'll paint the teeth in. And we'll continue, and we'll segment the painting together, because we exceed the depth of field of a skull projected at such a large size in a way that I can quantitatively calculate for you, which I'm not going to because I don't have time today. If I take that skull, rotate it up, this is what it looks like. Let me linearly compress it. It's wrong. The jaw is too long. It's got a bulge back here. And it's got that sinister right eye. This is how Hans Holbein created the skull that nobody knew before. And we can even see where he made a mistake. If we look, and it's a very easy mistake to make, he accidentally repeated that structure. What he should have drawn is, oops, sorry, is this. If I take that out, it turns out the, the National Gallery of, in London um, reconstructed this uh, 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 missing paint on this painting in the late 1990s. And they, had, they used a linear, he compressed paint a picture of a real skull to do this, and uh, which is wrong. It's a priceless painting, and they reconstructed it incorrectly. I wrote him a letter. <laughs> uh, and uh, actually, I got a response, and it was more than a two-word response. It was, uh, but it was basically, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Uh, we get many letters. Yours was one of them. Now, for the mathematically inclined, note that the skull, the magnification when I do this kind of projection is linear in this direction, but it goes as one over the sign of the grazing angle in that direction, and it's pieced together, so it's a uh, piecewise segmented nonlinear transformation. So an alternate explanation is if Hans Holbein could have solved a piecewise segmented nonlinear transformation, he could have plotted it out, and I don't think that's very plausible. We traced the work of these artists, Jan van Eyck, 
show, we showed that he used optics to project images 200 years before Galileo. But the obvious question the scientists ask, what happened earlier? And this led me to Ibn al-Haytham. So, and lots of information we've discovered that the science historians didn't know. Ibn al-Haytham is known by many names in many cultures in, in Western Europe, either al-Hassan or al-Hazain, Ibn al-Haytham. And the early optics texts, Ibn al-Haytham's um, book of optics was translated into Latin uh, circa uh, uh, 1230 or so. The first three geometrical optics textbooks that we use today were written by three, three gentlemen who not coincidentally were all Roman Catholic priests. And it's not that they were interested in geometrical optics, they were interested in the theology of light. They thought if in some way to oversimplify this, if they could understand physical vision, then they would let them understand theological vision. And here's the seven deadly sins represented by Hieronymus Bosch. And the seven deadly sins, in case you want to practice some of them tonight, I'll remind you, <laughs> wrath, pride, lust. One of the discoveries we made was in a text written by John Wycliffe, really the, the father of the Protestant Reformation. Apologies to the previous the speaker before last. Um, he analyzed the distortions of seven types of mirrors in the Kitab al-Manazir, and um, John Wycliffe used this as a teaching uh, allegory to teach the seven deadly sins through the seven distortions you got for the, the different kinds of mirrors. So what I'm saying here, and I could say in much more detail if I had more time, is that John Wycliffe's theology drew directly from the optics of Ibn al-Haytham, a Muslim scholar who did his work at the Al-Azhar Mosque in Cairo. What I'm trying to do, and I've been trying to do actually for a number of years now, and now I've made contact with, um, you've heard uh, the 1001 Inventions people, I've made contact with them, and uh, what I'd like to use are things like Jan van Eyck and Ibn al-Haytham to engage public understanding optics. And I've given over 200 lectures on art and optics in 32 countries so far. And Islamic countries where I've used heavily, uh, heavy amounts of material on Ibn al-Haytham are listed here. Um, circumstances have prohibited me thus far from going to, to accepting invitations in Iran or, or Pakistan. But I've done hands-on optics workshop based on his writings that I've developed these workshops there's the first page of one of the handouts that I've developed for these workshops, and it's about the Ibn al-Haytham's candle experiment, um, the, his camera obscura, and a, a number of, of, of really important concepts in modern optics can be taught through the, um, even just this three candle experiment. Here's what's so revolutionary about what you're saying. You're saying the history of art, the history of the Renaissance, is the history of optics. I am saying I know that, that, and you're blowing everything up. You're blowing everything that all of us who took art appreciation studied, all the art historians have written, and you're saying, you're all wrong. It's all about optics. <laughs> and, and indeed it is. And we owe it to Ibn al-Haytham. So that, the end. I'll end my talk. 29 seconds late, and I blame it on the um, audio. So thank you.